So let's talk about the health of your aorta. Your aorta is an organ. It's not just a tube. It's alive. It has its own blood supply. It has its own challenges. And I want to talk to you for a few minutes about practical things to consider as we think about the health of our aortas. Okay? So if you're in my clinic, I'm going to cover about seven things that to me matter in terms of the health of your aorta. The first one is movement. Movement is good. Dr. Braverman is gonna talk about the latest science in exercise. And I think it's very clear that many patients with genetic aortic conditions are afraid to exercise. And he's gonna chat with you about the, the knowledge we have in that database. I want my patients with genetic diseases to move. And I'm gonna to try to get five to 10,000 steps a day. If I'm orthopedically impaired, I'm gonna try some other way of getting movement. And he'll talk in much more detail about that. Related to it is many patients who have genetic aortic conditions are afraid of sexual activity. They probably shouldn't be. Sexual activity is healthy. It's excellent movement. And we have to promote this among our, our constituents because there's a fear factor and it never gets addressed. I address it in every clinic visit with my patients. Really important. Nutrition for your aorta also matters. We like a Mediterranean, what's a, what's a Norwegian diet? I don't know, is it salty fish or something? <laughs> I want a Mediterranean diet if my aorta wants to be maximally healthy. It's rich in fruits and vegetables. If I'm using meat, poultry, fish, not so much fried, trying to avoid salt, fat, and sugar in ways that I can. And that nutritional diet, your aorta loves a good body weight, right? As, as we gain weight, we add all kinds of factors to our health that are not good. Too much weight promotes diabetes. Too much weight promotes hypertension. Too much weight promotes inflammation in our bodies so that if we can attain a, a more ideal body weight, that is very good for our aortas. Um, if we have a tendency to blood pressure, then salt is critical. Lowering salt in the diet is so important to our blood pressure control. Just by going on a low salt diet, you can drop your systolic pressure by five points. If you have a tendency to high cholesterol, then it's all about fat in the diet, reducing fat. Potato chips, by the way, are not good for you. Okay, take home message number one. Um, what about sleep? Boy, did I value sleep last night after flying overnight. My aorta broke up so happy today that I was able to sleep last night. Sleep is really important for all kinds of parts of our bodily functions, including our immune system. But sleep apnea is a very important risk factor for hypertension. And people who have sleep apnea may not be larger people that we think about, right? You, you hear in the news that if you have obesity, then you're much more likely to have sleep apnea. That's true. But sleep apnea is very common in societies. And so my patients who have aortopathy, I wanna make sure I understand what is their sleep pattern? Do you have irritable sleeping? Do you wake up in the night? Do you wake up gasping like you stopped breathing? Does your sleep partner notice there's a problem with your sleep. Are you irritable during the day? Do you nod off when Dr. Eagle is presenting? These might be signs of sleep apnea. So finding um, healthy sleep patterns is really important for your aorta. And if you have abnormal patterns, I will send you to a sleep doctor to examine whether or not we should look at that. And if you should have a sleep study, whether it's at home or in a laboratory where you could have uh, formal sleep evaluation. Surveillance of blood pressure and pulse. 
patients who have uh, aortopathy should be very, very attuned to their blood pressure and pulse. Alan, if I fall off of this, will you save me? Okay. What kind of a blood pressure would we want to have if we have abnormal aorta? Well, ideally less than 120 systolic, the upper number. We'd like the lower number to be less than 80. The hypertension guidelines currently suggest below 130 over 80. But with patients who have aortopathy, lower is probably better. Probably below 120 is ideal. If you said, what's an ideal blood pressure? Who would you ask? I would ask somebody who writes life insurance policies. And they would tell you that a perfect blood pressure is 115 over 65. My blood pressure on an angiotensin receptor blocker is 115 over 65. That's where I would love you to be. Okay? I don't want you at 135. That's too high. A healthy aorta really doesn't like high blood pressure. What about your pulse? In general, we'd like your pulse to be around 60 or maybe a little bit less. So if you have an aortopathy, your cardiologist might be saying, you know, let's try to get that blood pressure to 120 or less. Let's see if we can get your pulse in the region of 60 to 55. Obviously, we have to titrate our medicines to your symptoms. And if you say, geez, I'm lightheaded at 110 systolic, I don't want to fall down. I don't want you to fall down. So I'll have to back off in order to find the right cocktail of medications that have you in the right spot. What medicines do we use? Well, we, we, we certainly know that in Marfan, beta blockers and angiotensin receptor blockers, those two classes have been most studied. <clears throat> and probably a combination, maybe a little better than either agent alone. What matters the most though, is blood pressure. Making sure that your blood pressure is in the range that we talked about by whatever means it might take. Younger patients may have a normal blood pressure. If they have Marfan, we want them on the medications because even with a normal blood pressure, the medications at reasonable doses tend to reduce the chance of aortic enlargement, okay? So how do you take your blood pressure? Golly, there is a science to this. We wanna use an arm cuff, not a wrist cuff. They're not as accurate. We want to sit quietly for five minutes with the cuff on. I like my patients to do three readings in a row, separated by about 30 seconds. I want the last one. And I want some in the morning and some later in the day. If you come to see me for the first time, I'll say, give me a week's worth. Give me 14 readings and send them to me by my phone or my email or on the portal. I want to know what your blood pressure is morning, and later, because then we'll design your treatment based on those numbers. So it's not just like simple, okay, I'm gonna wake up and take my blood pressure. No, we wanna get accurate sense of where your blood pressure is. We don't wanna do it after a meal. After a meal, your blood pressure tends to go down. We don't want to do, to do it after bird exercises. His blood pressure will be higher. I wanna know what your average blood pressure is. And if patients say, listen, I, when I do this, it drives me crazy. Then we'll put a 24 hour blood pressure monitor on them and do a reading overnight, which can be useful for finding blood pressure at night, which can be some, somewhat helpful. When you're sleeping, your blood pressure is supposed to go down. If it goes up, that suggests either a problem with your sleep or blood pressure that we need to treat more aggressively. Let's talk about imaging. Uh, Juan mentioned uh, the use of imaging to identify and track aortopathy. We wanna have some regular cadence of imaging surveillance 
to watch how your aorta is behaving over time. And in genetic aortopathy, it depends a lot on the size of your aorta, your family history. Is there a family member who died at a young age of an aorta problem? It'll be dependent on the rate of growth if there's any evidence that part of your aorta is growing. Juan mentioned that in Lois Dietz and vascular EDS, we can see aneurysms from head to toe. So the imaging may be from head to toe. Whereas in Marfan, perhaps it's just limited to the thoracic aorta or perhaps the descending aorta. We can use CT imaging, CT angiography. You're all familiar with that perhaps. That's very accurate, but it involves an iodinated dye, which has more radiation exposure. So magnetic resonance imaging may be preferred, particularly in younger patients. However, magnetic resonance imaging is in a tube. It's like a cocoon. And some patients go mental when they're in that. They get completely claustrophobic and say, I'm never going to see Dr. Eagle again. He sent me for an MRI. I hated it. In general, patients who have a genetic aortopathy, we're going to probably want to do their imaging annually. Um, and if their disease is limited to the ascending aorta, we may just do echo, echocardiography, which involves um, just sound waves. Um, if they have more extensive aortic or branch disease, then we may do an entire CTA or MRA every year. If the aorta is of certain size, like 40 to 45 millimeters in its maximum diameter, the imaging might be every other year, depending on whether there's been any change, okay? I saw a patient last week whose aorta went from about 44 to 49 over three years. He has Marfan, and so I'm now referring him to a surgeon for consideration of prophylactic repair because each of the conditions, as well as the family history, helps us think about, okay, at what size should we consider aortic repair? And, and every patient is different because they come from a different family. You're all unique. In our eyes, you're all special. And we wanna know what your family is like in order to give precise care. Self-advocacy, Juan mentioned this, I'm gonna mention it too. A lot of physicians that you see don't see a lot of people like you. And their knowledge base is based on three lectures that they heard years and years ago. And they're embarrassed by that. I'm embarrassed, I, you know? And so you have to be your own advocate. You have to have your own chart. You have to keep copies of the reports of all of your imaging. You have to be prepared to advocate for yourself, for your healthcare, for a proper treatment, et cetera. And this is interesting, isn't it? It's a dynamic between a patient and a doctor that can be challenging because not all doctors receive information from patients as easily as Dr. Bowen or Dr. Braverman. I have Marfan syndrome. Uh, you need to know, doctor, that my aorta last year was 4.2. You also need to know that my father died of a dissection at age 57. You have to continue to advocate for yourself. I'm thinking about, um, I think we should design a passport, Alan, that, that patients with genetic conditions would have that had all the key stats. So I could just hand it to the doctor and say, this is my medical passport. This tells you about my situation on one sheet of paper. But the notion of that is really important. When I send a patient, uh, when I send a referral letter back to a referring doctor, I send the, the letter to the patient too. So it's in your folder and it'll have listed all the imaging that you've ever had so that one could track, okay, yeah, there's a change in that ascending aorta that I need to know about. I wanna talk a little bit about um, 
survivorship. One of the things that the foundation is very interested in is, is trying to get into the mental health of living with aortic disease. And we're working on a term called thrivership. How do we, how do we get rid of fear and replace it with knowledge and then more effective treatment and advocacy? Juan has shown you that the number of publications in these disorders is just growing like that. It's amazing. But the number of those publications that actually deal with, how am I surviving? How do I feel? Am I afraid? Do I know what to do? Do I have confidence that my doctors know what to do? This is an area that we really need to work on. And I think the foundation is dedicated to trying to figure out how to improve mental health and also communication so that you can feel like there's a safety net. There's always a safety net for me. There's a number I can call if I have a question. I can't get the kind of network of doctors I might want. I'm from rural Montana. There are not a lot of aortic clinics in Montana. You'd have to drive five hours. That may be like Norway, parts of Norway. So there are, okay, then I need a digital consultation. How do I get a Juan Bowen or Alan Braverman digitally right now? That's, that's something that we'd want to try to work on. So a healthy aorta likes you to move. It likes you to have a great diet, nutritionally balanced, very thoughtful in terms of salt. It wants you to have effective sleep and it wants to get rid of disrupted sleep. It wants you to have a great blood pressure, not just good, but great. And that's on you surveilling it, not me once a year in clinic, that's on you. It wants the right medications for the right conditions and beta blockers that slow the heart rate and angiotensin receptor blockers that lower the blood pressure, lower the vascular stiffness are the right medicines. It wants to have itself imaged on the right cadence, probably annually, sometimes a little less often depending on the condition. It wants for the patient that has this aorta to be an advocate for excellent care. And it wants to thrive, not just survive. These are the things that I think about when I talk to patients about their healthy aorta and how to keep it healthy. Um, let me stop and let you ask me questions about anything I've talked about or things that I've missed. No questions at all. Are any of you on medications? I am. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So maybe just a comment that in many of the Nordic countries, we actually have the kind of passport in our wallets or bags always. That's great. Yeah. Do you have and a, I think it is. do you have a standard one that you use? Cause I'd love yeah. to see it. Oh, yes. That'd be great. Let me check. Okay. Um, yeah. Now. I Thank love you. that. Yes, in the back. Wait, wait, wait. wait, wait. Upcoming, yes, we want to, we have a, a Zoom audience. I want to make sure they get the question too. You talked about a passport. Yes. With all the necess necessary information. I call it my patient resume, uh, where I collect all my information uh, about me as a patient on one page, and I bring it to all my appointments. Exactly. Good for you. So that's so important, isn't it? And I think the rarer the condition, the more important that is. And, and some of our patients um, will encounter doctors who've actually never seen or recognized a patient having what you have, right? Juan. I have a question about medications because yeah. uh, so 
in the uh, earlier years, you know, we had a certain uh, beta blockers. Now we have newer beta blockers. There are several uh, classes of angiotensin receptor blockers, and there are uh, evolving studies with new dosing uh, programs, et cetera. What do you think is today, uh, also combinations, I would say, beta blocker plus angiotensin receptor blocker, what are some of your favorites for both Marfan and Lois Dietz? What's your favorite? Well, uh, so I'm kind of a person who's slow to change. Uh, <laughs> so I, many of my uh, Marfan patients are, are still on atenolol uh, and on losartan. Uh, for, I use combinations a lot. I, I have the same problem that you were talking about where the patient reports a, an adverse feeling or something that isn't quite right. So I may not use the highest dose of that particular drug, but instead I will use a lower moderate dose of a drug in combination with a lower moderate drug dose of say beta blocker, low moderate dose plus angiotensin receptor blocker, low to moderate dose. I'm I'm slightly different than you, Juan. I would say I'm not slow to change. Uh, and I think um, I use Valsartan and Olmosartan much more commonly than Losartan, even though Losartan is the drug that was used in the trials. I myself am on Valsartan. I think it has a longer half-life. If I do use Losartan, I'm often dosing it twice a day for a smoother effect. Um, I don't think atenolol is a once a day drug. Actually, I think it lasts about 16 hours. I don't tend to use it. I use long-acting metoprolol more. Um, so my standard, if you were in my practice, I probably would have you on long-acting metoprolol and either Valsartan or Olmosartan as my preferred. But the key there then is, of course, what's your blood pressure? It's not just about the drug and the dose. It's what's the effect? What's your heart rate? What's your blood pressure morning and evening? I want to be certain that they're great. If they are, I'm not sure which one in the class matters. Okay. Right. Bert? First of all, thank you very much for all that information. Um, I was sitting here listening to you, and I was thinking of one of my cardiologists who said exactly what you said. I want your blood pressure to be under 115 or at 115 or lower. And I want it to be lower than 80 in the 70s or in the 60s. I don't have a problem with the heart rate. The heart rate is in the 60s or 60 or a little bit below. So I'm good with that. Medicine takes care of that. But he wanted me to go on Losartan, 50 milligrams. And of course, what did I do? I negotiated with him. And I said, I'll tell you what, I'll start 25 milligrams. And what I found is that when I take my blood pressure in the mornings, it's 110. It's, you know, 107, it's beautiful. But when I do it in the evenings, it's back to like 120, 125, 130. So based on what you just said, I think I'm gonna go back and say, hey, what about if I take 25 in the morning and 25 in the evening and make sure I keep it at 115, which proves the reason why we do this kind of symposiums because we can always continue to learn. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bert. Well, having um, the chairman of the board have good blood pressure control is very important, very important to us. Um, a, lot of, a lot of patients don't know how to check their blood pressure. That's why I spent time in it. And a lot of doctors don't tell their patients how to check their blood pressure. And you might counteract and say, well, Dr. Eagle, why, why are you right? Why are you right? That strategy of sitting quietly with the cuff on and doing three readings and either doing the average or getting the last one is how we studied blood pressure treatment and its effect on stroke, heart attacks, heart failure. So we're using the technique that was used in the scientific studies of how to measure blood pressure. And you might say, well, it goes up with exercise. Of course, it should go up. But if we, if we control that average blood pressure morning, evening well, then we're doing all we can to keep that aorta healthy. And every one of us is unique. Alan's blood pressure in the morning might be high. If that's true, I'm gonna dose him in the evening to affect that morning blood pressure. If Bert's blood pressure is high in the evening, I gotta make sure his morning dose is gonna be adequate because it's gotta kick in very well through the afternoon hours. And this is why I don't tend to use Losartan one because I'm not sure how smooth it is. So I, I tend to use the longer acting uh, ARBs for that reason. 
but measuring it is critical. Yes, Michael. So it's, it's wise to use the arm. It's a great question. Which arm should you use? It should be the one that has the highest reading. Okay. And sometimes the right arm and left arm will be slightly different. I like my patients to choose the side that has the highest reading. And you might say, well, I'm right-handed. It's a lot easier to use my left because I'm better with my getting the cuff on these digital things are so easy, right? It's simple. So whichever side has the highest reading is the side you want to do. Yes, sir. All three on the same yeah. So he's asking the question, when you do three readings, do you do them on the same arm? Yes. I'm going to put the cut. Kim Eagle puts the cuff on his right arm, sits quietly for five minutes, push those, pushes the button three times. He takes the last reading. That's the number I'm going to use to decide with my doctor how much valsartan I take morning and again later in the day. How often should I do it? Once you're into a pattern of good control, you don't have to do it every day. You shouldn't become obsessed with that blood pressure reporting. But from time to time, you should. Probably once a month, I would say to my patients, you know, just do a few readings once a month or once every other month, just to, just to verify that we're in control. Are there other questions? Yes, Juan. Well, this question is only if we have time, but here's, here's my question. Why are we using such a primitive technique for checking blood pressure, the same as we used 100 years ago? With all the new Doppler, electronic, everything, tools that we, everything else has changed, is there something that is coming up on the horizon that will be a different way of checking blood pressure? So I'm sure there's something coming up on the horizon. Um, but the, you know, the interesting, I, I don't know how accurate the Apple watch that's trying to measure my blood pressure is. What I do know is it's not very accurate for rhythms. It, it misses a lot of AFib and it doesn't find a lot of AFib. I'm not a fan. We're going to get better with digital technology, but the science of proving that that technique allows us to have better control is going to probably lag behind, isn't it? So I may be old school in terms of how to measure the blood pressure until you show me that continuous recording allows me to change therapy that affects outcomes. That's sort of where I'm at on that. But yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm a fan of digital technology, but I'm not going to necessarily rely on it before it's proven to influence outcomes. Right. Um, how are we doing? Are there other? We're we're fine, aren't we? I I didn't actually go over, which is the first time in my life. <laughs> I can't believe it. Um, the comment on AI. Um, I think that AI is going to have a very large effect on how we study genes that are risk factors, but not dominant risk factors. You know, why do patients with hypertension, some of them have an aortic dissection and most of them don't? Well, maybe they have one of 150 genes that slightly increases their risk above what it would be just with the blood pressure. So I think AI is going to have a big effect as we study genetics, but there's a lot of noise in that. It's already being used in imaging, studying the nuances of aortic shape, and it's gonna, it, it already has a huge advantage there. Um, I am sure that we're gonna be using it in how we document medical care to do better, to be more standardized, not to miss things. Shoot, Kim Eagle saw a new patient last week and he didn't ask about sleep. That's an important thing he forgot. AI will help us not forget things, I believe. By the way, it's been around for 50 years. It's not new. It's just new in the media. It's been used for, for a long time in cancer and other types of uh, medical conditions. Okay, so I um, have a question, Alan. I was going to um, just make the comment that in, in the... Um, 
in the next in the session that's going to be in Trumso, uh, Matt Solomon, who's um, a cardiologist at Kaiser Health in um, California, he's very interested in in uh, leveraging the information that's in a person's medical records because it's all electronic now to um, try to help identify those at risk. So all the things that are imported and um, which could be you know, a record somewhere buried in there that has an aortic dimension uh, and the presence of uh, foot size and a presence of scoliosis and a presence of this that are, you know, the patterns that we recognize in an individual that somebody might not have all put together, but they're already written to highlight, you know, could that flag somebody for, hmm, can you consider this? Because again, once it comes to our attention, you know, think Marfan, then, then the clinician says, oh, I hadn't thought of that. So that's right. just the advocacy that you were talking about when a person says, hey, I have Marfan, that automatically brings that to our attention. But, but many of that's buried in the record that might not be as obvious. So he's trying to leverage that with, a, with one, and he'll present one of the abstracts on that. Coming that's up. fantastic. That's, it's a great chance. Okay. Um, yes, Joe. Josephine Grima, Chief Scientific Officer, the brains behind the foundation. Also in Trumso, and we had a webinar on this as well, um, AI is being used to help uh, diagnosis. And so they are looking for patients to um, put in their pictures so that we can get an earlier diagnosis just on facial features. Um, and that's by David Murdoch at uh, the University of Houston. Um, and we have a webinar on that where you can find that information as well. Great, thank you, Joe. Any other comments or questions? Okay. Uh